We're now going to hear from a triple I studio as we talk to uh, hear from Canada's biggest indie studio. Buckle up, we're in for 20 minutes of fun. So hello everyone, so I'm here to talk about Behaviour Interactive. I think it's a good follow-up to the panel we just had because once upon a time Behaviour was an indie studio as well. And I like what some of the panelists said about marketing because I am a marketing guy. So as a VP of Marketing of Behaviour, I will always advocate for marketing to be involved as early on. So you may or may not have seen this last week. We just opened a new studio in the south of the UK. So it's a, we are on a roll right now in the past 14, 15 months, opening studios and buying studios. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, about how we got where we are today. But first, I am Luc Duchesne, VP of Marketing. I've been in gaming for over 20 years now. One of my first job was to be a mascot, a Super Mario mascot at La Ronde in Montreal. Yes, I was doing that with the big head, walking around and taking pictures with people. And I was actually smiling underneath this big head. I was that dumb. I've been, I spent 20 years at Ubisoft, worked on very big games like the first Assassin's Creed, For Honor, Rainbow Six Vegas. And I've been at Behavior for two and a half years now. So a very long journey in gaming and going from a big AAA to a very big indie studio. So uh, yeah, ah, I, we kept that slide. It's not me actually, but that's what I did. I thought I cut that slide, but we kept it. So a quick video about behavior before I keep going. It should start. Or not. This year, Behavior Interactive is turning 30. A lot has happened in 30 years, so let's take a trip back through the highlights. In 1992, Behavior Interactive opened its doors in Quebec City. At the time, there were just six of us. In October 2000, Remy moved the studio to Montreal. Back then, 90% of our employees were in Quebec City. Around the same time, the biggest names in entertainment began hiring us to develop games for some of the world's best-loved franchises. And then came 2016, the year that changed everything with the release of our best-selling original title, Dead by Daylight. Since its launch, the horror action game has been played by more than 50 million people across all platforms. Behavior's team has more than tripled in size, and our revenue has skyrocketed, exceeding 225 million in 2021. Today, we're proud to say that in addition to developing our own games, we continue to help the industry succeed by lending our expertise and creativity to some of the biggest names out there. At 30, Behavior is the biggest independent video game developer and publisher in Canada. We're at the top of our game, with a fast-growing team that now numbers more than 1,200 talented people, an office in Toronto, and studios in Seattle and the UK. Long-lasting partnerships with the industry's top players, and a slew of thrilling projects in the pipeline. The future of behavior couldn't be brighter, and we're game. Happy 30th behavior. Here's to 30 more. This year, Behavior Interactive is turning. Good. Like, I have a problem for once, not twice, please. So as you've seen, Behavior grew a lot in the past couple of years. When I joined in 2021, I did a talk at MIGS in Montreal, and we were about 800 people. We're now over 1,200 people, so a quite big growth in the past couple of years. If we go back in time a little bit, like we built this company doing a lot of work for IR, doing games for other people. And you see in 2004, we had Scalar, which was an original IP, but we did not publish that IP. And during that year, we went from 100 to 400 employees. So at that point, we started to grow a lot. But in 2008, there was a financial crash, if you remember. So at that time, having a lot of clients in the United States, we paid a heavy price for that. So we had to regroup and we went through some transforming years at Behavior. First, we had to scale down a company. We had some tough choices to make at that time and some people had to leave the company for us to survive. Still in the surviving mode, we accepted less exciting projects because when in survival mode, you do everything you can to keep the lights on. And at the same time, we work very long hours. So those years were difficult, but were very, very important in the history of behavior. And because that is where we actually forged the culture of the company that we know now. And one of the key elements from the, the culture of the company is the respect of the work-life balance. This is something at the very core of the company. 
There's a very, very minimum of overtime you can imagine. We work our hours, we work very hard when we are in the office, then you go back home, or if you're already at home because we do work from home as well, you go back and you do your stuff, your personal stuff. We want you to have this balance between work and life. So this is where it all started. Then to be agile and efficient. Because working with smaller projects, you need to find good ways to produce games. You need to be efficient. So if you go from one project to another, you have to use the same tools. I know studios where they don't always use the same engine to develop games. So if you go from one game to another, unfortunately, you need to relearn certain things. While well, at Behavior, we try to use the same tools all across the board. This way, if you move from one project to another, you're efficient from day one. And also, is to work with very nice people. During those years, yes, we had to let some people go, but there were some very big studios in Montreal working on major, major games. But some people decided to stay within behavior and said, we're going to stay and build this together. So that's why we decided at that point, let's work with nice people, people we have fun working with. So if we keep going, around the same years, we launched Naughty Bear. Naughty Bear was not a big commercial success, but we learned one very important thing at that time. After years and years of being the hero in the game, saving the princess, being the bad guy was actually cool. Because Naughty Bear went on a murderous spree after not being invited to a picnic. I love the premise of that game so much. So, but we learned that people actually love that, being the bad guy in a game. So we have to keep that in mind for what's to come after that. Then moving forward, we set some new goals for the company. The first one was to have a strong culture and keep it. And that is in, on everybody's shoulder to do that. Yes, management, but every employees, every time we recruit people, we try to keep that in mind. What's our culture? Does that person fit in our company's culture or not? Two, and that is when Remy, our CEO, did set a key objective for the company to become the Canada, Canada's largest independent studio. When he made that objective clear to the company, I wasn't there at the time, but from what I was told, people just stood up and got a standing ovation in a big company meeting because it got a big objective that people could rally behind. Said, okay, this is who we're going to become, the biggest studio. And then it was to publish our own IP. We have done our own IP before, but always published by others. So Dan says, let's do it ourselves. This is when Dead by Daylight came out. As mentioned in the video, Dead by Delight, over 50 million players. It's been going on for over seven years now. Next week, yeah, next week we have Nicolas Cage coming in the game, which was super exciting. We had him at Summer Game Fest. So Dead by Daylight really brought something big to the company, brought us like a bigger form of independence because being so successful allowed us to really build the company. And now DBD became so big that we are expanding that brand. We have a mobile game, we have a comic book that just came out, a board game. Last year we had a visual novel with Okto New. We recently announced a game with Supermassive Games, a studio in, the, in the Guildford in the UK. We have one with Midwinter, a studio that we bought last year. And we also have a movie project. So Dead by Daylight went from being this small game developed by a small team. There were not hundreds of people developing that game to a game now being played by over 50 million people and having this big brand around it. So it's a true success that we can be very, very proud of because it's a game made here in Canada by a Canadian studio with an international success. So that is key for us. Good. But at Behavior, as I mentioned, we did a lot of work for IRE in our early years and we're still doing it. And that is why at Behavior, we have this balance this balance between work for hire and our own publishing and own development of our titles. And it is very, very important for us. And I don't know if you work for an indie studio or big studio or not. Maybe you have your own shop and say, I want to create my, the, the game of my dream. But I want to talk to you a little bit about work for hire and why it's important and why you should keep an eye on that. First, the benefit of doing that is predictable revenues. When you work on a game like that, you have a contract with another developer. They will come to you and say, I'm going to give you X dollars to create that content. By the way, there's a typo there, RI, don't ask me why it's there, I have no clue. I found out that yesterday and I couldn't change it, so it's there. If you haven't seen it, now I'll just point it out for you. <laughs> Sorry. So, but having predictable revenues will be good because this way you know what's coming ahead of you. And it's always a struggle for an indie studio to know 
what the revenue will look like in the future. So don't overlook the work for hire because you know what's to come. Secondly, you will learn from other developers. Whether you experience or not, maybe you spend 15 years within the same studio, but working with many different developers will give you the ability to learn from big studios or mid-sized studios, to learn their practices. How do they do things? Is it good? Is it bad? Their processes? And this is how you can build your knowledge and become a better developer with time. Third, networking. It's funny because in the panel right before, they did talk about networking and how important it is to build a network. In gaming, networking is fundamental. Like, I'm in my very, very late 40s, and I've done that for a very long time. I built a network during all those years. And right now, if I go in Montreal and pretty much, in every big studios, for sure, I know the general managers and a lot of indie studios because I've worked with those people, I built my network over time. But when you do work for hire, you will build your network as well because you might deal with one producer at Studio A. Maybe in three years, that producer, if he or she had a good experience with you, might be at Studio B and might remember you and say, you know what? I work with a small developer and they're really good. So I'm going to give them a contract and this opens up new doors for you. So networking is very, very, very important when you work in work for hire. Three, you become good with brands because if you see the image, yes, you have Halo, you have Master Chief, you have Assassin's Creed. Those games are not developed by us, but we worked on some of those games. And when you work on those big brands, you need to learn and you will learn quickly how those studios will treat their big brands. Then when it comes back to your own brand, you can use that knowledge to be better at what you do. And finally, deliver on time and on budget. If you get a contract from a big studio and they ask you for X for August 1st, well, it's for August 1st because they have to ship it for Christmas. So you need to learn to do those things because a game can be going on for a very long time if you don't put yourself limit of time and budget. Then this is what's for work for hire. On the digital side, this is the division I'm in, where we do our own game. It's what we call unique moments together forever. This is our motto. This is our editorial vision. For us, it's unique gameplay. We don't want to go in a sea of red. We want to produce content that will be unique, something different, a spin on an existing gameplay probably. But when you have a game from behavior, we want to offer something different that you haven't seen before. To us, a game as a service most of the time like games with live services, that's what we have with Meteor Maker, that's what we have with Dead by Daylight. Games are there to go for a long time. Then it's player and player, player versus player, or co-op, because that's together, that's how we do it. We want you to be with other people, to be with your friends, to experiment that, to be able to stream. And UGC content, for example, on Meteor Maker, when you can build your uh, your own map, when people will try and invade it. If I keep going with the story, 2022, behavior goes international. And for me, this is very important because I've seen so many big studios from around the world establish themselves in Canada, and it's great. I work with one of them for 20 years. But now we have a Canadian studio who's going international, based in, founded in Quebec City, based now in Montreal, with now a studio here in Toronto, a studio in Seattle, and two studios in the UK, and we are not done. So. This is in the past 15 months only. So behavior is going international and it's very, very important for us to be able to expand internationally, to have access to a bigger talent pool and more uh, opportunities for the company. This new reality changed a lot of things for us. First, from one central office we had before COVID to now hundreds of offices, but five business operation places in the world. What does it mean? It means we have one company culture. I talked about it. How do you export that to other studios? Well, it's when you're in the process of acquiring a studio or opening a studio, the people you talk to, you need to make sure that those people fit the culture that you built. Also, by respecting the local realities, especially if you acquire a studio. For example, we kept Midwinter's name in Seattle because it's important for them and it's good. It's part of their culture. But still, the way we work together fits the global behavior structure. Multi-site management. I was in a Toronto studio yesterday. I had lunch with 10 people on my team. It's great. I see them once a year. But multi-site management is not easy. If everybody is located in the same city, you can call an in-office meeting and you can all have lunch together. It's easy when you're 
all around the world or even all around Canada, it's a bit more difficult. It is a real challenge you need to take into account. Same thing for team building. Multiple time zones. This one might be funny, but when I spent all those years at Ubisoft, I was waking up in the morning to tens of emails from friends. When I was going to bed at night, I had emails from San Francisco. Now when I go to bed at six, go to bed at six, whoa. No, I don't go to bed at six. Not 6 p.m., not 6 a.m. <laughs> That's my younger me. Well, when I go, when I end my work day, I don't have that many emails when I come back. But now with more studios, we'll start dealing with this reality of multiple time zones and security, more offices. When you work on IP, it's important to keep an eye on security. So now what is behavior? We are the biggest Canadian independent studio. We have, off we have been going on for over 30 years. We have offices in Toronto, studios in Seattle, and two in the UK and we are over 1,200 employees. And for me, I am really proud of what we've accomplished because again, it's a Canadian studio who was going international and is expanding around the world instead of having other big studios coming in to Canada. So thank you very much. We have about four minutes for questions. I rushed that one. Wow. That's incredible. I feel like I kind of lived through some of your company growth there. That was, that was pretty relentless, but I'm trying to make notes about it. It was all great. So we have uh, Canada's leading independent studio here. Do we have any questions you want to ask about that? We answered a lot already in there. Oh, there's, they're, 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 they're a bit intimidated by your success. Don't think, be shy. Uh, don't be shy. Come on, have we got a question? Right, it's back to me then. So Dead by Daylight, huge IP. You've got 1,200 staff. You've got uh, offices all over the place, including the UK. Uh, it was in Cornwall, right? You said? It's a one in St. Millsborough and the other one, I can't remember the name of the city. It was done in the South West. I was, going, I went to school in this corner. Okay. That's why I, I was like, school. so where next? Where can you, you're already like the biggest studio. Where, what is the aspiration? Where do you want to go from here? You've, you've well, achieved that, that 2016 target. Do you have a new one? Do you have a new it's, stuff? Well, it's to keep growing. It's to keep looking for opportunities. It's to keep working on games. We had Meteor Maker who came out. We announced Islands of Insight just a, a month and a half ago and the Summer Game Fest Play Days, which is a game that we're doing with, uh, with Lunark Studio, who's actually based here in Toronto. Uh, so yeah, it's to do more and more and more and find good opportunities around the world. Okay, so uh, it doesn't have to be in Canada, but you, as you have more aspirations uh, in Canada, you can have, we can have more studios here, or you, have, you, have you filled, you've taken all of Toronto now? You... Well, I won't go into details, but we're looking at every angle. Okay, fair, okay. <laughs> fair enough. So, you know, that's uh, studio looking to be acquired. We have a couple of questions yeah. here. That'll take the Can we... Uh, she's she's we have dashing two right across. There. there we go. There's a lady here in the green, and I'll come to you so after that. Fantastic. Um, what would you say the distribution of your... You still do work for hire, right? We do. So what does the distribution look like, and do you split that up based on location and studios, or are you cross-studio working on the same projects? Like, what does that look like operationally? I don't have all the details. Sometimes some studios will work more on work for hire. In Montreal, we're divided in two. Yeah. We have, but not necessarily with a clean line and a 50-50. I don't know the exact number of teams on each side. But for Midwinter, for example, they're working, whoa, they're working on a game in, our, in the Dead by Daylight world. So this studio is working on that. In the UK, they will do more, more work for hire. But this is, it will depend on opportunities and projects. Sometimes it can be an acquisition with a studio who has an IP in development, and this one can fall more under the digital umbrella. And sometimes the studio has more experience in work for hire. So it really depends on opportunities. Cool. Got one more question. We're running. Oh, yes. oh you've got uh, a question. Yeah. Okay. You might get so to. my question is about uh, blockchain integration with traditional gaming. So where do you see uh, after maybe five, ten years? Is there any chance to integrate with blockchain stuff like tokenization, oh proof of ownership, uh, owning assets, NFTs, and all that stuff? You're going beyond my knowledge. <laughs> uh, so I will. I think NFT is not something we're looking at. This I can tell you for sure. But uh, beyond that. It is a little bit too much. Like no. it's another, uh, you can say, uh, passive uh, revenue stream from another platform. So like existing gaming is also integrating blockchain in order to generate uh, another revenue stream. So this is just about that. Yeah, but yeah, again, for blockchain, it's something I don't master, so I prefer not to, to go into. Right you now, our goal is to do games based on the vision I presented. So that's where we're going for now. No blockchain reveal today. So we've got time for one very quick question from the chat. 
the play dead teacher. So look, I saw that you're expanding uh, behavior all over the world, right? And you guys opened a huge door, bringing Nicolas Cage to that uh, that daylight. Are you guys have any plans of expanding also the folklore from uh, monsters from all over the world and bringing also like different uh, personalities or even streamers like Ninja or any other huge player in the market to gain more att attraction from the media? Right now, what we're looking at, and it's funny because when, when we got Nick Cage, my wife asked me why. <laughs> <laughs> my answer was, why not? Why not? Hey. It's because he is so cool and super nice, by the way. I had a chance to meet him. But it's for us, if, there's, if it fits the world, if it fits the logic of our world, we're open to it. Right now, the goal is to find, for any partnership, for any license deal we're looking at, it always goes there. Like, is that a good partner for us? Does that fit our world? And sometimes, some people might think it's a stretch. Some people might think, oh, it's so cool. It depends. But there are multiple people looking at that internally to make sure that when we do something like that, we're not going off track and we don't uh, jump the shark. Cool. Okay, so no, no one after. Where do you go after Nicholas Cage? That's that's a difficult challenge. That's I a good question. I interviewed him once. He was a very intense gentleman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank a big round of applause, please, to, for Luke, who's done a great <laughs> presentation.